When I was 14, it was the first time we had a trip planned to go to America. And I can't remember a time as a child where I was more excited. This was America. And so we were going to see our relatives in California. Because California is a long way, almost the midway of the flight um, from the UK to California is at New York. And so we scheduled to arrive in New York and have four days of sightseeing before we moved on to California. Now, I was with my parents, my mum and dad, and with my older brother and my younger sister. And because we were going for a once in a lifetime holiday, we were going for three weeks, we each had a large suitcase. And in those suitcases was everything we would need. Now, my mum was looking after my sister because she was young, um, and also she was carrying things like handbags and bits and pieces. So we had five cases between three men. Well, I say men, my brother and my dad were men. Um, so they took two cases each, and I was left because I was a 13, 14 year old with one case, but it was the heaviest of the five. Now, um, my role was to look after this suitcase. But unfortunately, this was in 1997, and I didn't have a nice Samsonite case with a handle that pulls out with spinny wheels. No, I had a 1980s canvas suitcase. No wheels, no drag along handle, just a carry handle. And it was heavy. Now, I could cope with getting the suitcase off the ca luggage carousel and putting it on the luggage cart, and I could cope with then getting it off the, the, the cart onto the subway, and then from the subway, carrying it up the steps to the top of the um, escalator, that was all fine. The problem happened when we were there on New York. The hotel we were actually in, and I don't know whether we got off a stop too early, was 10 blocks away. Now, 10 blocks is just shy of a mile. And where most people, you and I, would say, right, time to get a taxi. After all, we're in New York. The most iconic, well, one of the most iconic New York symbols is the yellow taxi cab. Uh, and you'd hail those down, we'd go off, it'd be easy, brilliant. My dad, though, no. My dad has an aversion to, to taxis in general, let alone when you've just arrived in a new country for the first time and um, you don't really know what taxis should cost um, and you've got five people with five suitcases, which means you can't fit into one taxi. You've got to get two. So he doesn't like one paying for one taxi, let alone two taxis. So my dad said, it'll be okay. We'll just walk. It's not far. It was a very long way. When you're carrying a heavy suitcase with no wheels, we got to the hotel and we were dripping. I mean, it was July in New York. It was in the thirties. It was hot. And needless to say, me and my brother certainly shared our discontent at walking that journey all the way we were doing it and also once we got there. And um, what I want to talk to you today about is baggage. My sermon today is called Excess Baggage. You see, as Christians, we are prone to carry around baggage that God doesn't want us to. He wants to take it off our hands. And God wants to destroy even the very memory of that baggage. See, all Christians struggle with carrying excess baggage in our lives. And I don't mean the actual excess baggage of all the rubbish you would find in my wife's handbag, of which there is a great deal. We're talking about the emotional and spiritual baggage. And the particular baggage I want to talk to you about today is the baggage of condemnation. Let's put that aside for a second and um, but before we look at that condemnation we just want to say that today is Good Friday so why is Good Friday good it seems a bit of an oxymoron to say the death of Jesus was good but it is good because Jesus took all of our baggage and weight upon his shoulders when he died upon the cross you see he was punished so we could be free and it's time to put down our excess baggage at the foot of the cross today so let's pray before we get into it. Dear God, I thank you so much that we are able to celebrate your son Jesus, that he came to the earth, lived a perfect life, showed us how to live, 
told us your word and he died on a cross so that he could remove all of our sin from us so that we could be seen completely pure and perfect in your eyes god i just pray that you would open our hearts that you would loosen my tongue and so that what i speak is words that you have given us these things we pray in jesus name amen so the Bible in John 3.17, not 3.16, that's a verse you'll all know, this is the verse after, says God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. You see, here we see Jesus doesn't condemn us, he saves us. Let me say that again. Jesus does not condemn you, he saves you. So if condemnation doesn't come from Jesus, where does it come from? Well, it comes from the devil, Satan. Excess, the excess baggage of condemnation comes from the devil's factory. And it's one of the most subtle and crafty devices he uses to cause Christians to be distracted from fully enjoying the life that Jesus died to give us. Condemnation makes us more focused on our sin than on God's grace. And its fruits are shame and fear. Condemnation would tell you, you can't be a proper Christian. Jesus can't love you because you don't read your Bible enough. You don't pray enough. Condemnation says, God will not accept you because of what you did in the past. Distant past, near past, even today. God can't really love you because he knows that you struggle with lust, anger, jealousy, bitterness, resentment. Condemnation would say, I can't be forgiven because I've let people down in the past. Condemnation says, I should be better. I'll never measure up. So Jesus can't forgive me. Are you allowing condemnation into your own life? Let me get you to look at a few of these scenarios and you tell me, well, not tell me, you think in your head, is this something you feel? So, do you relate to God as if he was a kind of permanent probation officer and you suspect at any moment that he may haul you back into the jail cell of his disfavour? How about this? When you worship, do you maintain a respectful distance from God as if he were a fascinating but ill-tempered celebrity known for lashing out at his fans? Or how about this one? When you read scripture, does it reveal the boundless love of our saviour or merely intensify your condemnation? And finally, are you more aware of your sin than of God's grace given to you through the cross? Some tough scenarios there. Remember that Jesus is in the business of saving, not condemning. And when Jesus took your punishment on the cross, he took your place. He took your punishment for your sin. And now when God looks at you, he doesn't see you as a sinner covered in all the wrong that you've done. He sees you perfect. He sees you justified. He sees you made right because you have been washed in the blood of Jesus and you are now perfect. Philip Yancey, um, the, uh, the guy who translated the... Um, original Bible into a contemporary version the message says there is nothing we can do to make God love us more and there is nothing we can do that can God that can make God love us less grace means that God already loves us as much as an infinite God can possibly love isn't that amazing and it's only when you have a revelation of what Jesus won for us that we can truly get our sin into perspective. And it's then that our heavy feelings of condemnation turn into healthy feelings, freeing feelings of conviction. Wait a minute, conviction? No, 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 conviction is not good. Well, it is. If you think conviction and condemnation are the same thing, they're not, they are polar opposites. Let me tell you about some of the differences, okay? Where condemnation is born out of guilt, conviction is born out of grace. 
where condemnation leads us to conceal, conviction leads us and prompts us to confess. Where condemnation leads us to feel remorse, conviction leads us to repent and turn our lives around. And where condemnation causes us to try harder, conviction leads us to surrender. And finally, in condemnation, we fail every time. But conviction leads us to transformation in our lives. See, some of us, some of you, will have been carrying so much condemnation for so long that you feel as though it's normal to carry that weight around you. And the truth is, apart from the cross, condemnation is normal. Without Jesus, we all deserve to be condemned and punished for our sin. But here is the amazing news of the gospel. Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So do you see any traces of condemnation in your life? Don't be surprised if you do. Whether you've been a Christian for a day, a month, a year, a decade... 50 years, there are always going to be traces of condemnation in your life. But don't keep carrying the burden of condemnation. Because of the gospel's power, you can com be completely free of condemnation. And not mostly free. Not a little bit free. Completely free. It says in John 8, 36, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So don't buy the lie that cultivating condemnation and wallowing in your shame is somehow pleasing to God. It's not. Or that a constant low-grade guilt will somehow promote holiness and spiritual maturity. It will not. It's just the opposite, in fact. You see, God is glorified when we believe with all our hearts that those who trust in Jesus can never be condemned never be condemned and it's only when we receive this gift of grace and live in god's total forgiveness that we are able to turn from old sinful ways that we used to live by and walk in grace motivated obedience let me clarify you don't become perfect through your actions because we will always make mistakes we'll always uh, sin but we are made perfect because Jesus' forgiveness, Jesus' blood washes us clean forever. Forever. Now, back to our suitcase. You see, it's not that God simply says, I'll take your suitcase, leave it with me. And then gives it us back later. Because that's what would have happened with the taxi driver. I give the suitcase to the taxi driver, he takes us 10 blocks, gives us the case back, we've still got the case. But what God does is he takes the case from you that's filled with condemnation and he completely destroys it. It's like when you hear the announcement at the airport. Doo -doo. Please don't leave your baggage unattended or it will be destroyed. You see, if you leave some baggage and it's found, the airport security don't keep it until you're ready to come and get it and they say oh here's your bag no they take it and they destroy it that's how bad that luggage is and condemnation you see is the same you see we feel remorse for our sin but when god convicts us of our sin and we ask for forgiveness he says in psalm 103 12 he has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west and not only has he removed it he has forgotten about it. Hebrews 8.12 I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. So it's as though God takes the suitcase and literally throws it away. Throws it into an incinerator. So it is incinerated, so it's vanished, so it's gone. And this is a difficult concept for us as humans to understand. Because we can forgive, but the memory of the hurt of what we're forgiving is always there we can't just delete things from our memory and this is where we struggle with this idea of forgiveness that God forgives and forgets but you see God the creator of life 
has the ability to do anything. And one of the things he does is he forgets your sin. He never sees your sin again because when he sees you, he sees the blood of Jesus that's washed you clean. And so it's gone. And what I want you to do is exercise the gift of faith God has given you to believe that Jesus died for your very sins that you are feeling condemned for. The punishment he has received was for you. It was for me. It was for everybody who asks for forgiveness. And his resurrection is proof that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice. The sins of your distant past, as well as the sins of yesterday, were all atoned for. And atoned means they were taken care of. So you need not carry the weight anymore. You can't atone for your sin. That's why Jesus did it for you. But don't stop there. Move on to rejoicing in the Saviour who came to save the worst of sinners. Because the truth is we're all the worst of sinners. For me, I'm the worst of sinners because I know the sin in my life that others don't know. You know your sin. And so we take that sin to God saying, look, as far as I'm concerned, I'm the worst of sinners because I intimately know my sinful behaviour. And obviously, you don't know the intimate nature of other people's sinful behaviour. So we go to God saying, look, I am the worst of sinners. And we lay down our suitcase of condemnation and kneel and worship at the feet of Jesus who bore our sins. And then we confess, as Paul did in 1 Timothy 1.16, but God had mercy on me so that Jesus Christ could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realise that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Even Paul regarded himself as the worst of sinners. And so let me clarify, you are going to struggle with condemnation, as am I. It's always going to be there because it's one of, like I said, the devil's most powerful weapons to try and pull you away from God's love he will keep using it and so we need to constantly remind ourselves of the promise or promises of God and a great scripture um, to remind yourself of that we've already looked at is Romans 8 1 there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus and what I'd suggest is look I've got it printed out I've got that by my bed. Maybe you want to put that by your bathroom mirror or in, the, in your Bible. And so that you can stay strong in the Lord. But when the devil con, uh, condemns, you can look at that and remind that Jesus has eradicated condemnation. And he convicts us to go to him and ask for forgiveness. Let me pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for being able to share the time together God online God we thank you that I've been able to share the good news of the gospel with those people who are watching and God I just want to pray two prayers God for those people who are struggling with condemnation would you really reveal this key scripture God that there is no condemnation in you Christ Jesus and would you let that, uh, your forgiving love, just drench them? And would you show them that they are fully forgiven? Not a little bit forgiven, not almost forgiven, but fully forgiven and restored. Amen. And I said I had two prayers. The, the second prayer is, if you don't know Jesus, as I've been talking about him as your Lord and Saviour, I want to pray and as I pray, I want you to repeat the words after me to invite Jesus into your life. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for all of my sins and wrongdoing. I ask for your forgiveness, God, and that I would be seen perfect in your eyes because I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. God, I turn from my wicked ways. I walk in the opposite direction. 
and want to spend the rest of my life following you and your son Jesus. Amen. Well, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, can I congratulate you? That is the best decision you will have ever, ever made. It's a prayer that now means that you are forgiven and restored, that you are fully forgiven. And what you need to do now is check out some more of our videos on YouTube, maybe get in contact with us, send us a message. If you're not local to Liverpool, wherever you are, find a good church, go there and tell whoever you meet, I've just given my life to Jesus and I want to know more. Um, someone will give you a Bible, if not go on Amazon, you'll be able to get a Bible and you have made the first step uh, for the rest of your life, not only on earth but for eternity. Just want to share with you a book, um, fantastic book, um, the cross, Living the Cross-Centred Life. This was the book that I got quite a bit of the direction from for this message. It's by CJ Mahoney, and I'll put a link below. That is a that's a book you want to get if you want to learn more about the power of the cross. God bless everyone.